Thanks to today's sponsor, NHS Professionals. I'll be talking later in the video about what they're doing to support the NHS this winter and how to get involved. I'm bringing back old school YouTube today and coming to you with a supportive video response. No drama here, no beef, just vibes and nuance. So the brilliant Khadija made a video sort of recently that they described as in defense of YouTube sponsorships. And as someone who went full-time creator about six months ago, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. I'm going to put a disclaimer here similar to Khadija's. These are my thoughts right now. They might well change. I might look at this in a year and be like, oh, that is not it at all. But such is the way of the world. We're going to talk about the nitty gritty of how sponsorships work and how YouTubers make money, but also dive into topics like transparency transparency, authenticity, deception, and the concept of labor itself to examine the ethics of sponsorship. I'll probably throw up a lot of questions and ideas to consider rather than ethical certainties or judgments, but spoiler alert for this video, um, that's kind of the point. How do YouTubers make money? This is a bit complicated because it's usually a combination of a lot of different streams of income. If you want to see a specific breakdown of this, I'll leave some videos below of creators talking about their different income streams specifically. But typically it will include AdSense, which is the money that Google pays to run those skippable and non-skippable ads on a video. Patreon or memberships, so somewhere where subscribers can choose to directly fund a channel through an ongoing subscription. Merch and courses, so selling products or online courses or lessons. Freelancing, editing, consulting, etc. So basically using your knowledge, equipment or expertise to to do like video production, editing or consulting for other companies or creators. Events, fees for speaking engagements, workshops or other events. Commissioning, so being paid a budget by a production company to create original content. And of course, sponsorships, being paid by a brand in exchange for introducing the audience to their product or service. For me, AdSense and Patreon combined changes month to month, but over the course of this year, it's looking to come to about half of the income that I received at my full-time job. Patreon is reasonably stable numbers. It adds Adds a lot of work to my monthly workload but for me it's worth it. The income from AdSense can go up and down by a lot. AdSense fluctuates not just by views but also by CPM or how much you get paid per thousand views. I've seen YouTubers who get paid literally 10 times the amount that I do for the same number of views so in four or five months, that creator could gain the same number of views as me, but have earned my annual salary from all my revenue streams from AdSense alone without any extra income, just because the CPM of the video was higher. This discrepancy is all about the companies that decide to put ads on your videos and your type of content, and you can't really control it without pivoting to do videos specifically on topics that have high CPMs, like real estate, finance, and tech. And then sponsors make up the other half of my income. I now work with a manager to make these happen. They take 20% of the fee and in return, they do the organizing and admin side of things. I do about one video a month typically. So for the most part, every video has a sponsor now that I'm full time. Since going full time, I also have some extra expenses. So I started working with a few people on my videos. And so money to pay them gets added to my previous expenses like equipment, closed captions and research materials. Khadija mentions nine different people that they work with on their videos at different times and wanting to pay them all above minimum wage. You get the idea idea these business expenses can add up quickly. I did a quick Google search and my full-time job before this I was making below the average income for London and now my YouTube income is pretty much bang on the London average. So hopefully that explains why sponsorships might be an appealing stream of income for YouTubers. These deals are not at the whims of the algorithm for the most part so there's a reliability there. It's more stable than AdSense which can drop off literally overnight and it's easier to build than Patreon and it also keeps content free for your audience. The Wild West for a long time, YouTube was known colloquially in the creator community as a wild west. There were predatory management companies, a lack of legal guidelines for sponsorship disclosures, and a lot of the big names were teenagers who didn't have a clue what they were doing. This has gradually been changing, and most countries now have some form of guidance by an advertising standards agency as to how to disclose ads and brand partnerships. We'll talk more about that later, but the fact that these are dealt with based on the country of the creator, and each country has their own guidelines, is kind of an interesting discussion. There are also huge differences on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of things like the rates brands are willing to pay, whether they ask for a view guarantee to get paid the full rate, whether they ask for rights to your content to use in their own advertising and more. Khadija talked in their video about this initial wave of sponsorship offers that came in because they blew up pretty quickly and subsequently having no idea what they were worth, what they should charge or how to deal with it. 
This is something that is consistently an issue within the creator community. This industry is extremely new and doesn't have the kind of regulations or legally required compensation that other industries do. There are websites that make money by charging you to find out how much money you should be charging. Both myself and Khadija relied on advice and knowledge from people we knew in the industry, but there are a lot of people coming up who don't have anyone they can ask, who are nervous to ask about money. And this will be especially true for those most at risk of exploitation, including young people. One thing I've noticed when thinking about this topic and money in general is that I've always had a lot of anxiety around money. I've been working and saving since I was in my mid-teens. I had more than one panic attack on the street at uni, worried about having enough time to work and study. And I'm also very risk averse. Like honestly, it is a pretty wild turn of events that I decided to take this like freelance creative path. Khadija talked about this kind of thing too. The idea that if you're used to working within a system that overworks you, that makes you stressed and tired all the time, it somehow proves that you deserve it because it's what you're used to. That's what you should be doing to earn money. The gap between the working conditions that I consider to be ideal for other people and the working conditions that I think I deserve is something I'm still untangling. In general, I'm a big supporter of things like universal basic income, uh, job security, unionization, the four day working week, flexi working, etc, etc. But when I wrote out all of the tasks that I needed to do on a monthly basis for my new freelance life and job and sent them over to a virtual assistant, I was genuinely worried that it wouldn't add up to a full week of work. I never calculated how much time I've been spending on my like side hustles before. And even though I knew that a four day working week is more sustainable, productive and humane, I didn't think I deserved it. Jokes on me, I'm now working weekends as well to fit all my tasks in, but this question of what someone has to do to deserve money is a complicated one, especially when people are looking at the output of online creators and influencers. Deciding who to work with. When you first start out, you might be approaching brands or agencies directly or scoping out online forums or apps where brands post open calls for collaborations. As you grow, you'll often find brands directly approaching you. And once you're getting enough of this type of interest, then you might end up working with management who will take care of this process for you. Management typically take between 15 and 20% of the sponsor's fee. But if they can get you a steady amount of sponsors, plus deal with things like negotiations and invoicing for a full-time creator, this is definitely worth it. So just because a brand wants to work with you, it doesn't mean that you want to work with them. Some considerations and priorities different creators might have could be, do I like this product or service? Do I think my audience would like this product or service? Do I think my audience can afford this product or service? Does this brand pay well? Is this product or service actively harming people? Does this product or service fit my priority morals? Are my contacts at this brand good to work with? Does this brand pay on time? There's probably a lot more to add to that. I have a few specifics that I've given to my management, for example, to help narrow down the kind of sponsors I'll take on, like no alcohol or drug related brands, no video or mobile games, and no weight loss or guilt-free food or nutrition brands. Basically just because either I don't use the product, so it's easy to rule out that whole category, or I consider them to be potentially harmful. Now, I don't want my openness in this video to act like a kind of got you moment set in amber, but as part of an ongoing process of learning and consideration. My list may well change next year or even next week. While researching for this video, for example, I came across a blog post from a creator who had written up their ethical considerations into an actual list that they would send to brands and included things like, if I find myself considering a sponsored campaign of any kind that includes other creators, I will work to confirm that there is a representative and equal mix of genders and ethnicities. So I've had a similar policy for event and panel invitations for a long time and have a list of creators to recommend to take my place if necessary, but hadn't thought to tell my management to express the same sentiment to brands for sponsorships because I'd always seen them as individual deals rather than clocking them as campaigns across a group of creators, even if I didn't know what other creators were going to be involved. I send my management information on any brands and products that I already use too, so they can directly approach those companies knowing that I am genuinely already obsessed with them. I don't work with companies that use products and services that I haven't tried and liked. I think a lot of people consider that to be an ethical baseline for sponsored content, a kind of black and white basic ethical decision. But I can see scenarios where that wouldn't necessarily be the case. For example, working with a brand that I wouldn't personally use, but that might be of interest to my audience. 
Binders, for example, are something that I don't have a use for, but I imagine a lot of people who watch my videos would quite appreciate getting a discount code for a comfortable and safe binder. In that case, I would talk to friends and people I trusted who would use them about the company, whether they'd recommend them and any misgivings and decide from there. So I guess on this note, it's probably a good time to talk about today's sponsor because, you know, not many sponsors can claim to involve the organization that saved my dad's life, but you know, here we are. I wanna tell you a bit about NHS professionals. I've not spoken about this a lot on the internet and not at all on YouTube, but at the start of 2020, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. The process of testing and diagnosis was followed right away by a plan of action for treatment all through the NHS, which meant that he came out of it not just cancer-free, but also free of any medical debt. I cannot stress enough how incredible his whole team was, especially when all of this was happening during a global pandemic. He had to go to chemotherapy and radiotherapy appointments alone because it wasn't safe for us to go with him. But the support and information given by everyone at the hospital who was working with him just meant everything to us. So I want to give huge thanks to all of the NHS staff, both medical and non-clinical staff who do this kind of work every day and made this awful process just so much easier. And this is where NHS professionals come in. So NHS professionals run the largest NHS flexible staff bank, basically placing temporary workers in NHS trusts and reinvesting any surplus they make back into the NHS, which is particularly important at times of need for the NHS and its staff like right now. They have opportunities available for everyone looking to help the NHS and its patients in times of need while earning extra money by taking on shifts, including non-clinical roles such as admin, finance and facilities, as well as people qualified in nursing, doctors in NHS trusts, allied health professionals, uh, healthcare scientists and personal social services. And medical students in their final years of training may already qualify to take on NHS professional shifts shifts even if they haven't graduated yet. They specialise in flexible working, meaning that you have control over where you work, what you do and how much in line with your qualifications and training. They want to give thanks and show support to their members through new initiatives after what has been a very hard two years for everyone. They've been working to expand career paths and enhance the professional development available to bank members, as well as offering flexible shift hours and the opportunity to earn paid time annual leave with every shift to support a healthy work-life balance. You can click the link in the description if you're interested in finding out more or signing up for additional shifts. So while looking at sponsors I might want to work with, I also look into like controversies, criticism and anything else that would influence whether I would personally feel comfortable working with them. Sometimes I feel like the criticism has been addressed by the brand already and I personally would feel comfortable working with them, but the public perception of the brand is still caught up in that controversy and so for me it wouldn't be worth it. The internet is not a place of great nuance a lot of the time and I wouldn't have to want to tie a sponsorship up with a justification about how the brand is totally fine now. now now, ethically might agree with me on my personal policies and guidelines, but you also might not. You might say it's too restrictive. After all, if I was more relaxed about who I worked with, I could just take the best paying deals and pay the people I work with more. That would potentially benefit those individuals a great deal. Isn't that a moral thing to do? Or you might think, actually, I'm not restrictive enough. I should only be working with companies that are carbon neutral or have a 50-50 gender split on their board of directors or other considerations that you prioritize in your own ethics. I think you're getting the picture that the ethics of YouTube sponsorship is a lot more complex than just a checklist. It's intertwined with questions we asked of all jobs about capitalism and labor, but also issues specific to this industry like parasocial relationships and influence. Finding brand deals. I get a lot of spammy offers that you can spot like straight away. They come from unofficial emails, um, like agencies without any online presence, and these get blocked and deleted right away. From an ethical standpoint, um, you know, they won't be good for anyone. And then you have the emails from brands that I'm just not gonna work with for whatever reason. They're legitimate offers, but just not my thing. And they get a reply to that effect. And then you have the brands that reach out or who my management are working with on campaigns who I'm interested in, but need more information about. I've had brands ask for sponsorships without giving me time to actually try their product or service. And that's a no from me, unless they can push the timeline and let me genuinely give it a go first. I've also had brands who have offered lower than my kind of established baseline rates. And if there's some other reason that it's adding value to the video or my career or the audience, then I may well still take it and aim to offset with another brand later 
in the year. Essentially a very similar process to a lot of freelancers who are pitching themselves to companies to take on projects. Does this job pay my day rate? Will it give me more experience in an area I was hoping to develop? Is it a good workplace environment? That kind of thing. But I would say that YouTubers are conceptualized as being different to other freelancers and this often puts them under higher levels of scrutiny. So the first most obvious reason is their place in the public eye, the influencer part of their job, regardless of whether or not they view themselves as an influencer. A freelance beauty journalist who writes a sponsored article for Elle magazine about the best uses of a skincare product is not viewed in the same way as a beauty YouTuber who creates the same content in video form. Brand partnerships are linked more directly to the creator as an individual and their content in comparison to other creative careers that also have ties to these kind of deals. Movies which include undisclosed product placement, for example, are often seen as separate from the integrity of the director. It's the fault of the producers or even a funny Easter egg, even though it's a lot less transparent than brand deals. Actors and musicians get paid a lot more than YouTubers for endorsing perfumes by looking moody and attractive in their adverts, but for the most part, it's seen as just a thing that they do, not a mark on their morality, whether they've used or liked that perfume already. Because of the unique kind of parasocial relationship that YouTube can create, Create, some viewers can feel like they know everything about someone's life and values by simply consuming their online content. And as an extension, some of those people feel not just the ability, but almost the duty to hold them to that standard. There's also this element that comes with the relative lack of gatekeeping on social platforms. Anyone could write a book, for example, but the gatekeeping of the publishing industry means that those who get chosen to be published are seen as legitimate. But with social media, everyone is on the same platforms and on that platform, other people make content without making any money from it. This is compounded sometimes by design, by the illusion of the lone creator. Many high level creators hire combinations of editors, photographers, assistants, writers, camera people, makeup artists, and more. But you might not know that from their videos where it's just them on screen. I remember only a couple of years ago when I was already entrenched in YouTube, being so shocked when a well-known video essayist tweeted out that every creator that they knew had a team or at least one employee, because I was just doing doing it alone. I hadn't really thought about the idea that people doing this full time might pay not just themselves and their expenses, but also needed to pay other people. This is the big focus of Khadija's video. And what I found really interesting because most of us don't grow up expecting to be in a position of controlling other people's income. Maybe at most we might be a manager and, you know, get to help people in a team. So suddenly being responsible for other people and treating them right was clearly daunting for Khadija. In the video they say, my main goal with doing YouTube, with trying to create whatever small business media thing this is, is to create a workspace where the people that I work with know that I value them as people above all first. So for me, one of the main ways to do that is by paying them a reasonable wage. So here the moral imperative is fair wages and conditions for work workers involved in the creation process. They also mention that they are proud of the sponsors that they have used and worked with and that they actually use the products and services, including their own discount codes. So a second major concern alongside that first is tied into these ideas of honesty, of pride and authenticity. But as I mentioned with the binder example earlier, you can have these same underlying ideals, but come to a different conclusion on how to implement them. Now, there are obviously examples of actually morally bad sponsorships that are so obvious that they don't really need examining very closely. The ASA, for example, approved a complaint against a weight loss product that was promoted by a pregnant celebrity because, um, you know, the post encouraged actually unhealthy practices like dieting and trying to lose weight while you are pregnant and, you know, growing another human being inside you. But beyond these extreme examples, morality is a complex beast. There are a lot of very famous philosophers who, you know, got their big break thinking they cracked it for a while before we all agreed, like, it's a bit more complicated than that, my dude. You might well have your own moral template to lay across the top of sponsorships. As I mentioned, I essentially have my own to determine my own decision making on that front. But something that feels kind of important to note is people's moral templates can differ from yours and still not make that person inherently bad or immoral or even make their decisions so. So what elements of sponsorships might be considered immoral? Deception and honesty. Can a brand literally lie, or at least use deception to imply something that isn't entirely true about their product? I mean, yes, they can. 
I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with my friend Tom Scott's video on VPNs doing exactly that in their sponsored advertising with YouTubers. A lot of creators trust that companies are gonna give them correct information, but especially with information on things like technology or scientific ideas, many aren't able to independently verify those claims. This might be especially pertinent for like a beauty influencer working a skincare brand, for example. Misinformation and mistakes there might influence their audience's trust in the very content that they create outside of that sponsorship. But it might be less of an issue if the sponsor isn't related at all to the content itself. A skincare brand working with a music reaction channel, for example. Does the beauty YouTuber have more of a responsibility to check the claims made by that brand? Or is it the brand itself at fault for deceiving the creator that they're working with? And does it matter at all if the piece of misinformation is not the thing persuading a viewer to try a product out? After all, I think we all know that a lot of people don't use VPNs for cybersecurity, where a lot of the overstating of their usefulness lies. In reality, they're actually going to buy it so that they can watch international Netflix. Probably the biggest potential for deception involved in sponsorship would be a lack of clear disclosure of the sponsorship itself, a foregoing of transparency. The UK introduced the Control of Misleading Advertising Regulations in 1988, defining misleading advertising as something that deceives or is likely to deceive the persons, and if by reason of its deceptive nature, it is likely to affect their economic behaviour specifically material deception, which is likely to cause the average consumer to take a transactional decision they would not have taken otherwise. So basically, did this advertiser trick people into buying their product? I'm not gonna lie, I kind of thought this was like a thing of the past. So in 2014, there was this big scandal around an Oreo YouTube sponsorship campaign in the UK. It felt like the first time that this kind of thing had gotten into the mainstream news. Basically, a bunch of famous YouTubers made videos involving a kind of viral challenge called the Oreo lick race, and included some big names at the time like Dan and Phil. The campaign ended up being banned because the videos were ruled as not being clear enough that they were in fact ads. The company argued that creators had put the fact that they were working with Oreo in the video description and that they'd said in the video themselves that they were working with Oreo. This led to the ASA ruling that the commercial intent would have had to be made clear before viewers engaged with the content, which is why for a while you'll have seen UK YouTubers putting ad, ad, hashtag ad over all of their content content just in case. Disclosure for those who remember the Oreo debacle is just part of the job now. And in the UK, at least every brand I've worked with has included very specific and clear information about how and where to disclose, just in case the creator is unfamiliar with the most up-to-date rulings. But the other day, I watched a video by an American YouTuber with millions of subscribers that only mentioned Shopify being the sponsor of the video nearly at the end of the video as part of the storyline of the video itself, but didn't disclose what that actually meant in the video itself and there was no mention of it in the title or the description of the video either. So clearly for some, this isn't seen as deception at all. Potentially, sponsors have become such a normalized part of the fabric of YouTube at this point that for some, it doesn't seem to need an explanation or declaration. Out of interest, I had a look at some celebrities, you know, actors, musicians, Instagrams to see if they had disclosed their clothes and jewelry and photos of them on the red carpet as hashtag gifted which is what online creators are expected to do for anything that they're sent for free. And literally none of them had. They have just as much influence, often more than online creators. So why the difference? Potentially it's because it's just known and accepted that actors are given things to wear on the red carpet. It doesn't need to be disclosed because it's obvious. Or potentially they should be disclosing and this is a mistake and they just haven't been as attentive to ASA guidelines as digital creators are. Because it's not just obvious attempts at deceiving an audience that have landed creators in hot water in the past. The ASA in the UK ended up condemning any use of hashtag spawn, sponsored, in association with, or only tagging the brand in social media posts, instead instructing creators to replace it with hashtag ad or hashtag gifted only, depending on the circumstances. YouTube's This Video Contains Paid Promotion label has made this a lot easier for UK creators, as for a while there, even a 30 second end read at the end of like an hour long video would mean putting ad in the title and the thumbnail. Even though the brand had no control over the rest of the content itself, under the assumption that this would be a good way to let an audience know that the video contains some ad content before they started to watch, they could decide if they wanted to or not. But it kind of just made it more confusing by implying that the whole thing was like an hour long advert. The idea behind this is based on the idea of influence. 
the same concept Khadija digs into in their video. Creators talking about a brand seems more authentic than it would coming from some random commercial with a bunch of actors telling them that they need to get something, you know. There's a difference between a random consumer leaving a positive review for a product and someone with any social capital or influence being seen to endorse it. But there's also an interesting spectrum of influence depending on the creator. Literal influencers who are selling a lifestyle, a look, a way of life, are much more open about the influencer part of their jobs. And there are also many creators on YouTube who see influence as a useful but wholly accidental and privately undesirable secondary outcome of their work. Brands are willing to pay for them to talk about their company in a video and that money funds the video themselves, but the audience isn't there specifically to be influenced in the same way. Maybe that makes the influencers more honest or the other creators more trustworthy. I think it depends on the outlook of the viewer. There is a kind of honesty in just pure influencer culture. The brand deals are part of the work itself intrinsically. Khadija reflects an element of that honesty in their video saying, part of my job is doing this, introducing y'all to products and services that I use, that I enjoy, that are helping me pay for the content that you love, because that's what it is too. They're helping me out. They're helping the crew out. We've got to be honest about it. Ultimately, that's the transaction that's happening. We go in these cycles with the moral framing of sponsorships, I think. So we had the OG YouTubers, often teenagers, who were seen as aspirational. And so sponsor content was either cool or not really understood or picked up on by the young audience. We then had these waves of things like the ASA backlash, um, the attitude that sponsorships are a kind of selling out, uh, creators trying to be as creative as possible in integrating sponsors so they felt totally part of the video. And then creators deliberately doing the opposite of that, breaking the fourth wall and cheekily eye rolling at their own repeated sponsors. And more recently, we've seen a more kind of supportive, like you go get that sponsor money kind of vibe from a lot of audiences. At this point, with a lot of the content that I watch and my own videos, sponsor content is kind of like a section of the video, which is essentially an ad break. It's not a pandering to relatable authenticity or a meta knock against it. It's just the professional reality of making videos as part of my living. Authenticity and trust. Throughout all of these waves, there's always seemed to be a sense of ethical goodness and authenticity. To be authentic to one's self, content and audience is often seen as intrinsically linked and that authenticity is the foundation of trust for digital creators. In the article Ethics of Authenticity, Travel Influencers and the Production of Sponsored Content in the Journal of Media Ethics, they lay out the difficulties of defining an ethical framework for digital creators. The lack of a preeminent professional organization for social media influencers makes it difficult to discern the ethics of influencer marketing. To better understand journalistic ethics, one can read the Code of Ethics created by the Society of Professional Journalists in the United States or the National Union of Journalists in the United Kingdom, often finding common ethical tenets across the globe. Although the influence industry is becoming increasingly professionalised, and there are several associations for bloggers, none of these can presume to speak for such a diverse and disparate group of social media professionals. Instead, these researchers suggest that a sense of authenticity is itself the guiding ethical principle of digital influencers. But authenticity itself is a subjective proposal. None of us shows the entirety of ourselves to the outside world. Does authenticity mean that any endorsement of a brand must be genuine? Or does the authentic framework of someone like Khadija, interested in being a good employer and paying decent wages, take precedent? Because bringing in a fair wage is as valid an authentic desire. Would someone who does something openly for personal wealth alone be seen as more or less ethical than someone who is secretly holding such desires, even if both of their actions in working with brands based on, say, the biggest payout is individually authentic? Is it just the public perception of authenticity? being authentic to what the audience sees as the creator's truth that matters here. And what the hell happens when someone's authentic self changes? I think we're all familiar with the creators who have been making the same type of content for years. Some because they genuinely still love and enjoy it, but others because it's what has worked so far and why rock the boat. Behind the camera, their authentic self could be totally different. Other words that come up, particularly with sponsorships, are around it being natural or credible, which, what does that mean exactly? Exactly. That if a creator's sponsor choices don't match up to the like perception of their natural interests, then it's inauthentic. 
In that scenario, ironically, a simplified persona can be seen by some viewers as more real than the genuine complex web of interests that someone might have in reality. A self-styled gaming bro creator, for example, might well love the new Mac makeup palette, but would his sponsorship with them be seen as automatically inauthentic based on how he is perceived? This is further complicated by the pressure to make your content focused and niche to remain in favor with the algorithm. When I asked about this topic on my socials, a lot of people asked if creators actually try the products and services, or if they're required to pay for them themselves before they take a deal. The implication being that unless you pay for and use a brand that you're sponsored by, there is something inauthentic or untrustworthy about that, regardless of whether or not you claim to have done so in your video. I wonder if this is a line that people are concerned about when it comes to traditional media, or even if they think about it at all. If you've ever read a list of recommended products in traditional publications like Elle or Vogue, or even well-known websites and blogs, the people writing those articles will not have bought any of that product themselves, and most likely they won't have tried most of it either. I used to work at a women's online magazine and we would get quite literally hundreds of PR packages through each month just for the beauty team, full of free product, and none of it ever had to be declared as hashtag gifted. These companies would send free gifts alongside that in the hopes of getting on these lists. We had free cake, biscuits, donuts, brownies, like every lunchtime branded of their company logos trying to get featured. And it was the same with their sponsored content. The writers almost always didn't use the product except when it was literally required for like a photo shoot tied to the sponsored article, like for a hair dye product, for example. Potentially a middle ground here is the framing of the relationship between creator and brand. The difference between endorsement and support. There is a difference between saying this product is amazing and this company helped fund this video, here is a bit about them. The second is pretty much always going to be true, but the first isn't necessarily the case. So why might some creators run the risk of inauthenticity by skirting towards the former, even if it's not true? Creation as labor. This is uh, not meant to be a woe is me section of this video. I feel very lucky to be doing something that I actually enjoy for a living, but I do think it is interesting and healthy to look at the ups and downs of any career path and the way that some aspects of work are unavoidable within our current like hashtag girl boss, productivity hacks, monetize your hobbies culture. Burnout is something that I know has been discussed a lot when it comes to online creators. Combined with the pressures of constantly improving the performance of your content, encouraged by the back end of YouTube, which will update you in real time as to how your new video is doing compared to your other nine videos. This isn't a typical freelance job that lets you leave a contract to go work for a different company you are the whole contract and the platform is the company. Unless you decide to change your job and pivot to something outside of YouTube, those numbers are, for the most part, going to control your income. And those numbers are also not necessarily related to how good your content is. I came into this video thinking that I would just talk about YouTube ethics in terms of like individual ethical behavior and choices, right? Like decisions that have been made about what is the ethical standard for sponsors and sponsorship over the years. But the more that I researched around the topic, the more I realize that this kind of can't be separated from labor-based ethics in general. All the ethical questions and considerations that go into creating on YouTube cross over with questions about any and every form of work. There's this chunky 20 page piece in the International Journal of Communications from 2020 called A Critical Analysis of Attempts to Regulate Native Advertising and Influencer Marketing, which framed the job of digital creator and influencer as just that, a job. There is a consensus among critical academic works that being an influencer is a precarious and often exploited form of immaterial labor. Being a social media influencer demands visibility labor, emotional labor, self-branding labor, and glamour labor, on top of the more traditional workplace labors of like editing, shooting, producing, writing, etc. Another article entitled The Rise of Intermediaries in the Social Media Influencer Industry from the year before that points out how new entrants to the industry are more likely to work without financial compensation, while many creators practice self-exploitation by over-delivering to earn a good reputation among potential brand partners and therefore aspiring influencers assume the entrepreneurial risks inherent in these efforts without any protections or workplace assurances, especially when their livelihoods are inextricably linked to platforms over which they have no real power or control. Editorial control. I also got a lot of questions about how much brands control what you say during the ads themselves. Do brands give us a full script or a list of ideas, tell us to just look at their website or use a product and come up with our own thoughts? To be honest, it depends on the brand. It can be a total mix. 
At the moment, brands are tending towards talking points. So here are the unique kind of key interesting things about us and our product or service, like fit some of these in. Sometimes they have very specific wording you might have to follow for a section. A skincare brand, for example, might well have to be very careful of the wording of the ad so that the creator doesn't overpromise based on the results that they've seen and instead sticks to the facts. I think there used to be a lot more heavy scripting. It's what these companies were probably used to with celebrity endorsement type agreements, but brands are now realizing how forced it sounds. So they leave it a little bit more loose for the most part. This product is great is often the implication of these talking points. For a lot of creators that works for them, they use and like that product. So they're only saying what they would if they were recommending it to someone who asked. But could someone say that they think a product is incredible when actually they haven't tried it or even actively dislike it personally? How can you trust what a creator is saying about how they feel about a product? So here's the thing, um, ultimately, I guess you can't for sure. Some creators won't take sponsors from brands that they don't like, but others are happy to treat it as an ad read, like they would if they were an actor in a commercial. I guess it's similar in that way to other jobs. When I worked at the checkouts at Tesco, I couldn't say anything bad about the company to anyone who saw me there. The difference is that influence. My complaining to a coworker in earshot of a customer might not persuade them to stop shopping there, but someone with an audience of thousands of people who trust them has far more potential impact. I think maybe because I've been involved in this industry for so long, both like through my own work and through friends and also through working at a company that hired creators, that I forgot that most people don't actually know what's specified in these brand contracts. When I asked on Instagram questions that people had about this whole topic, there are a lot of things that I thought were common knowledge that were in fact a bit of a mystery to a lot of those people. If a creator is aiming for authenticity and transparency, how much can they assume that their audience understands about the unspoken aspects? For example, I got the question, is the whole video sponsored a lot? Basically, can you just say and do whatever you want outside of that particular sponsored section? Does the brand have any control over the rest of the video? even like the video topic, for example. So this is really interesting to me as a question because for a while, the Advertising Standards Agency in the UK requirements actually treated videos that were entirely sponsored and those that just had a sponsored segment as the same thing functionally. When just a segment is sponsored, it's like a commercial break on TV. It doesn't affect the content of the rest of the video. But when the video itself is a dedicated video or advert, the whole video can be under the editorial control and influence of the brand. And that can get tricky especially if creators try to integrate ads to make it more interesting or natural for an audience. Okay, let's say you have a beauty YouTuber who has decided to do a glam look for Christmas video and they have an offer of a sponsorship from MAC for their new lipstick. It would be a bit strange for them to do a whole glam makeup look, not include this lipstick and then just have a chunk in the middle where they're like, also check out this lipstick. Like it would make sense for them to use the lipstick in the look itself. In the contract, Mac didn't technically ask for the lipstick to be included in the look, but it's a pretty safe bet that they'll get it even without paying extra because it would just be strange to do an ad for a lipstick and then not include it in the look. But that video could just as easily have been fully sponsored. Mac might have paid for the whole video, pitched the Christmas glam look concept, given them a list of their main competitor brands that the creator can't use in the video itself alongside the MAC lipstick. Or the beauty YouTuber might have decided to do a video with a makeup look that was entirely from like one brand to see how the products work together. And I've seen videos like this where a creator will talk about a particular brand and a lot of the comments are like, if this is sponsored, just say. There's just this expectation that it has been sponsored and that this creator is kind of getting flack for not being honest even though the honest thing was that it wasn't sponsored in the first place. And that same creator could make the exact same video with a whole face of Mac products, have come up with that idea themselves, and then reach out to Mac and say, hey, do you actually want to sponsor this video? Because that kind of makes sense. And it would be the same content of the video as if they hadn't been sponsored, they just would have been paid for it. Like the video with and without external control from the sponsor might have been exactly the same. And then even if you saw the technical contract that was signed and it says the brand had no power of editorial control, there is a power dynamic at play that might affect the outcome regardless. Sure, the contract doesn't explicitly say like, you can't talk about the brand negatively in this video, but if you wanna work with them again, are you going to badmouth them at all? Does the brand really not care if you talk about the negatives or is it just such an obvious assumption that you'll be positive that the brand doesn't think it needs to be stated in the contract? 
After all, we wouldn't expect the writer or director of a TV advert for the same company to mention the negatives within the ad. One person on Instagram asked, what ways do sponsorships impact the creative process for good or ill? Quite honestly, I think the restrictions and algorithmic changes over the year from YouTube itself have had more of a conscious effect on the type of content people I know make compared to brand sponsors. Demonetization, restricted mode, video length to ad ratio can all affect the success of a video and channel. Whereas sponsors from outside brands, so long as it isn't a fully sponsored video that the brand controls the editorial for, can pretty much be integrated into any video. I've never had any brand concerned about the content of my videos, but I have had YouTube restrict my videos, as you may remember, from a few years ago. But there are definitely ways that sponsors might affect the creative process negatively. They might have very specific and strict deadlines that if you want to work with them might rush the timeline of a video or you might have one of those like dedicated full ad videos where the brand wants a lot of editorial control over the topic or the script without necessarily having a lot of knowledge about what works well in a YouTube video. I think the best brands understand now that they're hiring that person for a reason and the creator is the one who knows the audience best. So giving them like the goal of the ad, whether it's to bring awareness or signups or link clicks and then letting them run with it is gonna be much better for everyone involved for the most part. At their best, sponsors can elevate the end video and the creative process. So for example, I've only done, I think two fully dedicated brand videos on my channel. The most recent one was in 2019 with the historic Royal Palaces. They approached me because they'd created LGBTQ plus history tours and events across their landmarks. And they were interested in partnering with me on promoting them. They were offering the chance to talk to a queer historian and curator in the Tower of London, something I knew my audience would love and something that I would have had trouble organizing on my own. But I didn't know a lot about the organization itself. So I went back to them with a lot of questions, including what their policy was on criticism of the monarchy, considering that I have, um, let's say an indifference to the royal family at best, and they literally are the organization that's like in charge of historic palaces. And they replied with this. With regards to your perfectly valid reservations about discussing monarchy, we're keen for our social media content generally, and this video series especially, to be frank, playful, and provocative. And we would absolutely encourage you to be honest and opinionated. The series is all about getting external contemporary perspectives on our objects and stories, and opening the palaces up as places for proper debate. Nothing is off limits. So in this video, me and this historian talk openly about the failures of museums and collections to reflect the diversity of our history, the classism, racism, homophobia that affects this sector even today, the importance of not just seeing these landmarks as places of royalty, but also of the equally important working class people who populated them alongside monarchs. Khadija talks about a similar idea of implied editorial control in their video when they talk about the fact that some channels are more appealing to brand deals. Even without meaning to, there may well be creators who self-censor their own sponsored content for fear of losing their income if they come across as too challenging for potential sponsors. This, I think, has an even higher potential to affect the income of creators whose identities are often stereotypically linked to aggression like black and trans creators. This bias, even unconscious among marketing teams or brands, might well label the most uncontroversial content by these creators as too much. I think here we can see sponsorship, much like quite literally everything else in this world, is connected to other issues and power structures. So the fact it's quite hard to find information on how much brand deals pay online, for example, is an interesting one. If we see creators as freelance workers and employees, which, you know, we kind of are, it makes sense that most people don't disclose the numbers online, even if contracts don't prohibit it explicitly. It's kind of the same reason that you're advised not to give your previous salary at a job interview. You want to be paid what you are worth, not what you have been paid in the past. When a creator grows or improves their content, they also want the freedom to change their rates, which is hard if they're publicly putting out a record of their rates at an earlier date. And the inverse effect can also have an impact. If a brand, especially a small independent one or a charity, sees your rates from a big global brand, they might assume that they're priced out of working with you, even if you would in reality have lowered your standard rates to work with them. Brands pay vastly different sums of money depending on their budgets and their marketing priorities. There were private chats that happen 
at like creator events and in DMs where creators share rates amongst themselves, similar to workers at the same company sharing salary information. But this obviously disadvantages those who are outside of this world who might find it harder to find people to reach out to. And again, when we look at the structures of power that raise up people of a certain race or class that have already got contacts, especially when collaboration plays such a big part in creator growth, there's also going to be creators who rise up outside of that built-in community and support. And those creators are potentially much more likely to be from marginalized identities and experiences. I myself will always be totally open with other creators and have been known to disclose like any money information that might be useful. Like the first time that I meet someone at VidCon or somewhere in the city, like I see someone I don't know who posts about being really excited about like brands wanting to work with them for the first time. And I'm jumping in their DMs like, okay, Okay, let's make sure you have all the information you need. And there are also now anonymous databases which have gathered this data to try and give more transparency to the industry while also looking at the potential for gender and race pay gaps like influencer pay gap and FYPM. Okay, so it's time for me to make my concluding remarks now. I honestly did not mean for this to be as much of a monster video as it was. I was like, I'll just make a quick little video response, a little extra video in January. Tra -la 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 -la. But um, I've never been relaxed a day in my life, so I guess here we are at the start of March talking about ethics for like an hour. As I said at the beginning, this video was not one I came into, like a lot of videos that I make normally with like a thesis or theory that I wanted to research and prove or disprove. It's just something that I'm currently living as a full-time creator. I would definitely be very interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. You know, anything in this video that surprised you or your answers to any of the many questions that I posed during it. If you'd like to help support me and my work, then I mean, I kind of told you at the beginning of this video, but you can take a look at my Patreon. And for this video, you can find out more about NHS professionals by clicking the link in the description. I will also put links to my social medias. You can find me all over the internet and also a link to pre-order my book, which is coming out in a few months time. Have a little look at that if you're interested and until I see you next time, bye.